Okay, first of all, I would like to say all praises be to the Most High. I'm waiting till you all settle down and then we can go into the, uh, the class real quick. You don't got to rush it too quick. But just trying to get through it real quick. This is really a preparation for the, the feast tomorrow night. Oh, okay. All right. First of all, I would like to say all praises be to the Most High and thank everyone for coming this evening. And what we're going to do is break down and resolve, according to scriptures, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Number one, uh, in past time, when we first began to understand we were Hebrews, we were dealing with strictly calculating through the times according to the moon, right? So from sundown to sundown, we knew that sundown started a new day and we was dealing with the moons. We realized according to the scriptures that you can't calculate the months through the moon because the moon comes in 10 days short every year. So obviously it's the sun and the moon together in which you can calculate the full 364 days, all right, 52 Sabbaths. Now, uh, after equal parts night and day, coming out of the winter, that's signifying a new schedule for the year. It's a point, it's an appointed time or what the scriptures call new moon, but it really means new month, bringing in the springtime, which is a Sabbath. All right. You count 14 days from that and you have 14 days from that. And that gives us what? The Passover. It's on the 14th day. Let's get there, that real quick in Leviticus, Leviticus 23. So now we know that the Passover falls on a Sabbath every year, right? The first day of the year is uh, uh, usually when the, when, when the new year comes in, it comes in on the first day of the year, and it ends on a Sabbath, all right? So you count 14 days and we have a Sabbath, right? Let's read Leviticus on the Passover, what it tells us. Come. This is uh, the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verse 1. Yes. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feast of the Most High. Concerning the feast of the Most High. Which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. Even these are my feasts. Read. Verse 3. Six days shall work be done. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. In holy convocation, ye shall do no work therein. So here it is. That's the first holy day, which is from Sabbath to Sabbath. Go on. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Go ahead. These are the feast of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Which is holy gatherings. Go on. In the 14th day of the first month at even. Now it says holy convocations in their season. So the first season is what we call spring. Right? Read. In the 14th day of the first month at even. Which is Friday sundown. Read. Is the Lord's Passover. Is the Lord's Passover. Right? So we know when Friday sundown happened, it begins the Passover. All right? Now what... what was bringing in the confusion is when it says Friday or, or the Sabbath at even. But there's two evenings for Friday. There's the Friday when it comes in from Thursday into Friday, mm -hmm. and it's the evening when the sun is going down at the end of Friday, which is Saturday sundown. Right before it goes into a new day, it's still an evening. Mm -hmm. Y'all got that. Y'all understand that. So you got the first evening when it comes down. That was the night that Christ with the disciples that night had his feast or had his lamb actually a day before the actual feast that was in scriptures. Why? Because Christ had to fulfill himself being the Passover lamb. He couldn't be in two places at one time. He couldn't have the last feast with the disciples and be the sacrificed lamb at the appointed time 
according to Moses. So he had his feast that night, which was the Holy Communion. And that's what we're doing now. Do y'all got it? Y'all y'all understand that? Huh? Okay, what, what don't you understand? Um, what time period is even? Oh, okay. You don't look at the time according to how you look at a clock, okay? Because what we're dealing with is sundown, okay? When sundown actually begins, it's still, just say hypothetically, we're looking at Thursday, we're looking at Friday, you understand? Just look at that as our example right now, right? When Thursday sun is going down, you're still into the late part of what you would call Thursday. It's not until the sun go all the way down that we're into the new day, which is what we would call Friday. You understand? So it have nothing to do with how you look on your clock. It have everything to do with looking outside and seeing when there's no light and the sun is, is all the way down. You're in the beginning of the new day. You understand? That's an evening, right? And then you have at the end of it, right before you go into what we call Saturday, that's an evening too. You understand? Right before you go into Saturday, that's an evening. So what you have is you have the beginning evening that begins the day, the day and you have another evening going into what? Saturday. Saturday night going into Saturday to Sunday. So you really have, really, you have two night times, which you can see with your own eyes, within each day. You got the going down of the sun on Thursday, going into the evening on Friday. That's the beginning evening. Then you have at the very end, you understand, another sun going down. Right before that is when Christ was crucified. He, when, he was, when he gave up the ghost, right before that. So he was actually sacrificed the same time the lamb was sacrificed in the Old Testament that went on the doors. You understand? He had to fulfill that according to the law. Every part of Christ's uh, uh, life, even him dying, had to be right on the same hour that the lamb was sacrificed during the time of Moses. So if he was the sacrifice that you know the sacrifice that he got for him and the disciples wasn't the same exact according to the Old Testament. You understand? No. When he went and told them to go get the, the lamb, mm -hmm. that was for them knowing that he had to be the physical sacrifice fulfilling what was written in, Mo in Moses' time. You understand that? So he had his private feast, and then when he was sacrificed, mm -hmm. that was the regular feast. You understand? So the church always used that as a marker for communion the night that Christ was with the disciples. And that's what we're doing here. But the actual feast happened, or, or the sacrifice actually happened, when the sun was nearly going down to make preparation for the feast. And see, the error that people have been making, looking at the moon and all that, how long is the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Seven days, according to scriptures. But going by the moon and dealing with that when the sun go down, people and others <laughs> who had no knowledge at one time was actually having how many days of Feast of Unleavened Bread? Eight. They was including the Passover with the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. When really, the Passover is in connection with the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it starts at the end. You understand? So when the sun go down at the very end of that Sabbath, you understand when Christ was crucified was the day going out, the Passover day going out, the sacrifice happening, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread coming in. Do you got it? Every, everyone can understand. Finish reading what you have in Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus. 23. Leviticus chapter 23, Salakia. Go ahead. Leviticus 23, 
verse 5. Go ahead. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You understand? Now, when you read it there, it, it would make you believe, when you look at it initially, that it's speaking of a separate 24-hour period. But it's not that way, because it's talking about the Passover beginning where? At the end of the 14th day, at that evening. And then the feast, the preparation of the lamb is being prepared. Once Christ was taken down off the cross, the preparation is happening for when that night comes, they're in what? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Y'all understand that? Come. So now they're in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. What happens? The next day, Sunday, if you go back to when we were in Egypt, we was up out of there in haste right after that. So Sunday, we jetted out in the Old Testament. <laughs> you understand? So that's how it happened. It, 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 was, it was a Feast of Unleavened Bread going into what you would call uh, uh, Sunday morning that we were looking to get up out of there. Between Sunday morning and Monday morning, we was, we was leaving in haste with no leaven. Exactly. So as you can see, everything in the New Testament parallels the Old Testament. So if you want to know how it actually happened, you look at Moses and what happened with them putting the lamb, the blood on the door and all that. And you look at that same time period and parallel that with when Christ dealt with this sacrifice, not when he told the disciples to go get a lamb. You understand? Because Christ is the lamb. You all follow me here? So the mistake people will make is they'll see that Christ went and got a lamb, but he got a lamb a day early knowing that he had to be the sacrifice fulfilled under Moses' law. That was the accountability. He had to do it exactly how it was done under Moses. He had to be that sacrifice. Right? Finish reading. Uh, this is verse 6. Go ahead. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread Go unto ahead. the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. Read. In the first day ye shall have an holy convocation. In the first day is a holy convocation. Why? Because right after the Passover was sacrificed, the Feast of Unleavened Bread come in. And that's why we're doing our feast <coughs> Soon as the sun go down tomorrow, that was the sacrifice going into what? The end of the Passover into what? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it's all connected. It's connected one after the other. At the end, at that evening, <coughs> is the Passover. That's that last evening before it's going into what? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's connected. And it's a seven-day period from that point. You got it? So it's seven days. It's not, a, it's not a complete eight days. If we were to look at just the 14th day, it's Friday night, and start there, that would make it eight <coughs> days of unleavened bread when the Bible tells us it's seven. We all see that, right? Come. So technically, the night before, because don't forget, what is the reason the Most High told us to get the, use the unleavened bread? When we left Egypt, we left in haste without, and we forgot to get leaven. There was a lack of leaven, a, so small an amount that we were cooking bread in the wilderness unleavened. <coughs> you see that? It was, it's a small ration. It wasn't enough to go around, right? So now, when we look at this, technically, on the night before, when Moses had the lamb there, we were still in Egypt, right? So we didn't leave Egypt that night in haste, so we still had leaven, right? So technically, the leaven didn't start until the next day, technically. Right? But Christ tells us in the New Testament that he become, uh, uh, he, he says, put out the leaven so that we can be a new lump to Christ. And that's why we include it tonight, because he said, put it out. But technically, the unleavened didn't begin until after we left. See, 
Are you following me? So we just break it down each piece so you will understand why we do what we do according to scriptures. So when the disciples afterwards got together with their communion, that Passover communion in remembrance of Christ at that table like we're doing tonight, they made sure there was no leaven. Okay, so that we can be a new lump for Christ going into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Are you following it here? That's, that's clear. Okay. Go ahead, read it. Uh, verse 7. And the first day ye shall have an holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work therein. You shall do no servile work. So if you are not, not to do any servile work in that first day of unleavened bread, what is that day? It's a Sabbath. It's a Sabbath. And that's why in the New Testament, it says that we must take him down. Christ was on the cross and it says, take him down before the Sabbath. Why? Because the Feast of Unleavened Bread after the Passover is considered a what? The Sabbath. A Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So when some people, when you may see it in the New Testament, it says, take him down before the Sabbath. You might think it's the regular Sabbath cycle from the seven days to seven days and think that it's talking yeah. about taking them down before Friday comes in, before Saturday, before yeah. Friday night comes in. Yeah. But it's not speaking of that because the Feast of Eleven Bread in scriptures, which is a day after the Passover, the Most High said, do no servile work, which means it's a what? A Sabbath. So that's the Sabbath yeah. it's speaking of. The Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread written up in Leviticus 23. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay, finish. Uh, verse 8. But you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And the seventh day is in holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Okay. That's and that's crystal clear. All right. Now, how do we know when Christ got the lamb that that wasn't the lamb at the appointed time according to Moses. How do we know that? Because Christ had to fulfill every part of the law. You understand? Him killing that lamb the day before is not him fulfilling the law of, of himself being the sacrifice when that lamb was killed during the time of Moses. Are you following? Is that clear? Okay. Right? Let's get it to show you that according to the scriptures, Christ had to fulfill every part. Uh, this is Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Yes. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5 and 17. Go ahead. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. So Yeshua says, think not that I've come to destroy the law. Read. Or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Christ did not come to destroy what was written in the law, but to fulfill every part of it. Read it. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jote or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. When Christ was speaking of no jot or no tittle shall pass from the law, he was speaking of himself fulfilling what was written. Not, not even a small portion will be different than what was written in the Old Testament. Every piece will be exactly the same according to his fulfillment, even to the sacrifice. Every piece will be the same. No jot or tittle is speaking of himself in the law. Read. Till all be fulfilled. And when he was speaking of till all be fulfilled, he was speaking of all what he had to fulfill. Right? Let's go to Luke 24 and let's get a little more on that. Before that, I just want to read one real quick. Go ahead. Uh, St. John chapter 3, verse... 13 through 15. Go ahead. Then come up Yeshia from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I, need, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Yeshia answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. It's becoming, it, 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 it's becoming to us, speaking of him and John, to fulfill what? All righteousness. All righteousness, what was written in the Old Testament. So Christ was a living fulfillment. So even to his sacrifice, when he actually gave up the ghost, that was the same time the Passover lamb was killed in the Old Testament. And they used that lamb as preparation for what? That night when they ate, when the blood was on all the doors. 
So that night was what? That night was Saturday night when the blood was on all the doors. Y'all see that? Y'all sure y'all see that? Um, excuse me. The blood, when they killed the sacrifice and they drained the blood, mm -hmm. they put the blood at the end of the Sabbath on all the doors. The Sabbath wasn't done yet. Right before the end, that blood was draining out, and they took the blood and put it on all the doors. What? That Sabbath night. Do, are you following me here? You got, again, you got Friday night evening, and you got Saturday evening. Right? The sun is not fully come down on Saturday night. It's still at the even or the end of the Sabbath. You got that? So they take that blood and put it on all the doors. Right? And then after the blood is drained, they ate the sacrifice that night. So the Passover went on that night. As far as, you, are you following me? The death angel came midnight that night. Are you, you got it? They killed it before the sun went down, before it was totally dark. Do you got it? That was the blood. You understand? So Christ had to fulfill that with his own body the same exact time. So when Christ killed one the day before, that was for the disciples in the church to commune so that he could fulfill the Old Testament himself. Do you got it? You sure? Okay. Read on. Uh, this is uh, St. John chapter 24, verse uh, 25. Read. Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? Go ahead. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He started going through all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And him being sacrificed and being that sacrificial lamb was part of what he had to fulfill according to the letter. He had to fulfill it exactly how it was done during the time of Moses. Are you following me? Okay. Now, let's go to Matthew 26 real quick. Uh, St. Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 1. Okay. Now, as you know, when you read the Old Testament, if we went over that, we're going to go in it, into it more, more in depth tomorrow night. You had that Saturday night, and that next morning, the Israelites was out of there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You understand? <laughs> we were gone. We started leaving that next morning, which would be what? Sunday morning. That's when Pharaoh said, get up out of here. I'm going to allow y'all to leave. And they, we jetted out. Mm -hmm. That was Sunday morning getting out of Egypt. You got it? Mm -hmm. So now the Passover has passed. The Feast of Unleavened Bread has, has passed. And now we out that next morning. Right? You got it? During the time before the sun go down, Sunday. So we're still in what? The Feast of Unleavened Bread when we left out in haste without leaven. Right. Do you have it? Yes, yes, yes. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so before the sun went down Sunday, we was out of there because, and we left in haste. Mm -hmm. Before Sunday night went down, we were gone. Sunday morning, we're still within the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Mm -hmm. The death angel then came. We're out that morning. It's still Sunday morning. We're jetting out, and we're still within the Feast of Unleavened Bread until the sun go down. And then there was that journey to get out of Egypt, and that's why we got that seven days unleavened. You got it? So everything is a fulfillment of how it happened in the Old Testament. And that's why we keep it seven days. It's speaking of our journey going out in haste without leaven. Crystal clear. Right? Go ahead. Uh, Matthew 26 and 1. Read. And it came to pass when Yeshua had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, 
who, and consulted that they might take Yeshia by subtlety and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. And when Yeshia was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, then came unto him a woman having an alabaster box, a very precious ointment, and poured it on his head, and he sat at meat. And when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment have, might have been sold for much and they, given to the poor. Now there's something key there when they said that they, they had to take him, right? Mm -hmm. Read that again. Uh, verse 3, then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people. Here's the Pharisees, scribes, and they coming together saying what? Unto the polis of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, mm -hmm. and consulted that they might take Yeshia by subtlety They're and gonna kill him. They're going to take him by subtlety and kill him, read. But they said, not on the feast day. Say it again. Not on the feast day. See that? Mm -hmm. So when they took him, they knew that that night wasn't the what? The feast day according to what, how he was dealing with it in the Old Testament. Uh -huh. That was Christ's feast with the disciples the night they took him. Do you see that? Uh -huh. Is that crystal clear? <laughs> so the night they took him wasn't what? It wasn't the feast day. Because the Passover starts at the end of it. At the end of it. That's the evening it's speaking of in Scripture. Not when it comes in on Friday night. It's speaking of the end evening. Not the beginning evening. To make preparation for the feast. Do y'all have it? So it's still within that 24-hour period, if you want to put it that way, so we can understand it. But instead of it being in the beginning of it, it begins at the end when Christ died before the sun actually go all the way down. Then it goes into the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You got it? Is that crystal clear? So we're looking at that whole 24 hours and believing that it starts at the beginning of it, but really it starts at the end of it going into Saturday. And that's why we're having our feast at the same time. At the end of it, going into Saturday night. You got it? Because Christ was beat and all of that. That happened Saturday morning. All that happened Saturday morning into that day when he dragged the cross and all that. So he had to deal with it from the time they got him that night. He had to deal with his persecution from that time to till his crucifixion near the sundown the next day. Right. And when it says our Passover has been sacrificed for us, we have to look at that as the time period of the Passover. You got it. Come. On. Read. This is our verse uh, eight. Come on. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Yeshia understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she have wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me have, or me ye not ye have not always. Okay, go ahead. For in that she have poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial of her. And that's why each year we speak of this particular event as mm -hmm. a memorial to the sister the Most High sent to prepare Christ for his burial. Right? Read. 14. Then one of the disciples called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest and said unto him, what wilt thou give me, and I will deliver him unto you? At that time, Judas agreed to, be, to betray Christ. Read. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Yeshua, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for to eat, or prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, 
Go into the city to such a man and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. So Christ kept the Passover at his house with his disciples. Mm -hmm. That was their Passover. Why? Because Christ had to fulfill the actual Old Testament Passover with his own death. Mm -hmm. Is that crystal clear? Now, it's still within that 24-hour period. Mm -hmm. It's still on the 14th day. But Christ is keeping it early because why? He must fulfill how it was done during the time of Moses. It's still within the Passover 24-hour period, but Christ did it when the sun went down Friday night, knowing that he would have to be the sacrifice fulfilled in the Old Testament the next day. Do you all see that? So you got two separate sacrifices here. You got the first sacrifice so that he can have the last supper or the first communion with the disciples. Mm -hmm. And you have himself being the sacrifice of fulfillment of the law. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're having the communion tonight. And we're going to have the regular feast with Christ being the sacrifice mm -hmm. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Beginning when the sun, before the sun go all the way down tomorrow. See, is it clear? All right. Go ahead. And he said, go into such a city or go into a to city or to the city to such a man and say unto him, the master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep my Passover at thy house with my disciples. Now, let me give you another example real quick. Just say if Christ did his sacrifice, he, he went and told the disciples to do it on the appointed time of the Old Testament, right? Just say he told them to go do that so that he can have the Passover at what they, you would call the correct time during the time of Moses. And Christ gets sacrificed the next day. Would he be a fulfillment of the sacrifice of the Old Testament? That's common sense. He wouldn't be a fulfillment of what happened in the Old Testament. So what is he doing? What is he fulfilling dying a day off course? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you have two separate scenarios here. You got the regular Passover that he that he had that he did with his own sacrifice, with his blood. You understand? And you had what you would call a pre-feast within that 24 hours so that he can have it with his disciples and prepare them for the mission. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have two separate things going down in a 24-hour period. One in the beginning and one near the end. John, I'm going to read this real quick. Yes. Uh, Luke 22, 13 through 15. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with them. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired, uh, one second, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Before I suffer. It's in scripture. Read chapter and verse again. Uh, Luke twenty-two fifteen. It says, with desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you. I desire to eat this Passover with you. Before I suffer. Before he suffers. His suffering is the killing according to the Old Testament. OK, so this is actually resolving the full understanding of it, the beginning of it when he did it with his disciples and him fulfilling it himself with his own death. It's covering both within that 24 hour period. Right. Y'all got it. So it's still within the Passover time from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. You got it. OK. Now, finish reading Luke 26. I mean, uh, Matthew 26, please. Uh, verse 20. Now, when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him. Okay, for, just for those that have been paying attention. Are you reading? No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. 
Okay, no, g give me that real quick. Thank you. I appreciate you. Read it again. Uh, St. Matthew chapter 24, verse 22. And they were exceeding sorrowful, or 26, verse 22. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him. Hold on. Excuse me, pass this to him, please. Yeah, you got it. You got it, buddy. You, you have one? Yeah. I need you to read. Okay. Read it. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them, one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in this dish, the same shall betray me. Why did Judas want? Why did Judas want to betray Christ? Why did? What was his issue? Uh, huh? Yeah, from the treasure. As far as Christ, the uh, Yeah, because it could have made money. And he was stealing the money. Yeah, and he wanted to steal the money. He wanted the money for his own acquaintance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he tried to make the disciples seem like it was for the poor when he, he wanted to come up off of that money. To prove that, he went and got 30 pieces to make up for what he would have received if he would have sold the oil. You understand? So he was a thief. And he made the disciples and others, and see, that, that coup against Christ is because this is what he was telling the people. He was telling the people, here it is, he's telling us we're here for the poor. But look how much money the poor could have could have made off of this. Look look how many people we could have fed off of this. Not telling people his true intentions. And that's what happens when you have bitterness in your heart against someone. You always say you're part of it to make it seem like, okay, I don't really, you know, I'm not going to say that I got a problem. And I'm, and I'm putting that out there because that's the spirit that Judas had in it that happens. And when usually when you hear usually when you hear something from a person, you rarely hear they part in it. Do you? Yeah, because they know that if they pose it a certain type of way, it'll make them look innocent and it'll make the other person look what? Look guilty. When really he didn't say his intentions in his heart for that. He just said what he knew people would agree with. That's the spirit of Judas. And I notice when so, so many people try to speak and go against someone, they always bring a part and say something that they know everyone would agree with because it's right. But they never say what their true intentions are. Or they would be corrected by that person. But they'll always say, well, this is what Christ would do. And these people are not doing that. You understand? Trying to be the accuser. And that's why you have to always look at people who are always accusing. That's the spirit of Judas. They're always accusing someone of something as if they're innocent. So I'm putting this out there to show many examples of how people can be walking. Any of us at any time can be susceptible to the spirit of Judas and don't even realize it. Accusing others of things. <clears throat> and then, on, and then when, when the conversation comes up, you don't bring your intentions in it. You only talk about what you can point at that somebody else is doing wrong. Mm -hmm. That's the spirit of Judas. Because here it is. He, who looked like the good guy in all this originally? Judas. Hey, Christ, we can give this to the poor. Christ was like, man, you, you'll always have the poor with you. I'm being prepared to die for you. <laughs> The Most High will bless you with more for the poor. He said, I'm not going to be with you. I'm, I'm about, to, I'm being prepared to die. But who's look like the good guy amongst the people? And see, Judas was in that position. Why? Judas was actually the, the, the greatest betrayer because he was one of the closest to Christ. And one of the most respected with Christ, dealing with Christ's treasury and dealing with all types of good business that that was needed amongst the, the work. So when he spoke, people listened. So so here it is. We got a scenario here where this betrayer is now coming off as if he's the good guy and saying it should be for the poor. 
But then a few hours later, he's with the enemy looking to give up Christ for 30 pieces. And, and they ask, well, Christ, who is it? Who is it? What person is it? And he says, when I put my hand in a dish, the one that will put his hand in a dish with me is it. And you notice Christ didn't call him out. Christ didn't say, you deceiver, you liar. I know what you did. Christ didn't accuse him. Christ was still going to die for him. Mm -hmm. Christ didn't show no hatred for him. Christ broke bread with him that night, knowing what was in his heart. Right? Read. Uh, 24. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. That's deep. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? Is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. Yes, you have said it. I didn't say it. Hmm. Hmm. Three. 26. And as they were eating, Yeshua took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. This is our bread. Wow. Hey, so, where's your bread? Uh, 27 and he took the cup and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink ye all of it for this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins Go ahead. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you and my father's kingdom. He said, this is my last drink of wine. This is my last communion with you brothers until we're sitting together in my kingdom. Read. Uh, 30. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then said Yeshia, or then said Yeshia unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be gathered abroad. Shall be scattered, right? Or scattered abroad. So like it. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Yeshia saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. He had to deny him three times. Mm -hmm. If he wouldn't have, they would have crucified him too. Mm -hmm. Read. So he said, listen, you're going to deny me. You're going to have to. <laughs> right? Read. 35. Peter saith unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Now why couldn't Peter die with Christ? Because Christ anointed him and says, mm -hmm. On this rock will I build my church. Come. He had to have someone who would bring forth the spirit of the Most High and lead the church. That was Peter. So he knew Peter would have to deny him because they was going to run into Peter. And say, I, I noticed you, you was with him. And he was like, no, no, he would have to. Now, it, even though it hurt Peter to do it, it really hurt it. But he understood he had to at that time. And he remembered what Christ said once the cock crew three, crowed three times. He remembered it and it hurt him, but he had to. Who was going to build the church? Who's going to finish it? Read. Uh, 35. Peter said unto him, though I should die with thee. Yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Go ahead. Then come up Yeshia unto them, or with them, unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. 
So he went to pray, read. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Go ahead. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may pass, may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were very heavy. And he left them and went again and prayed the third time, saying the, the same words. Then cometh he to his dis disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The hour is at hand. And from that point on, mm -hmm. those that were coming to take Christ was there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right? So we're going to continue this going into the Passover tomorrow night before the feast. But before we do that, let me read the, that in Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Come. And then we'll have our feast. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, verse 1 Corinthians 5 verse 5 to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Yeshua your glorying is not good know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump do you know not a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump read purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump okay so in the Old Testament the reason for unleavened is because we left in haste, but it signifies something greater. Mm -hmm. It signified that we wouldn't have something that influenced us, like leaven influences bread, or when leaven gets in something, it a little bit changes the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what sin does in us. Mm -hmm. When sin is in a, introduced, it could be something small, but it affects the rest of our lives. It affects the whole thing. So that unleavened was really representing how we need to be under Christ and still be fed. Okay. It, of course, bread is good and cake is good and cookie is good and all the stuff that leaven does. But you can be nourished without it and not have no influence. You can still be nourished through the spirit and not have those things that lead to sin. Hmm. <laughs> you understand? You, you, you can... It's the thing where that the insatiable appetite or the things that that's that happened with our, with our father, Adam, that seed that was that, that was in us. Christ had to undo that. That's why he says we must become unleavened. We have to be like we was. We still had nourishment. We have to be a new lump for Christ. Unleavened. So that's what it represents in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. Right. Come. Read. Read. Purge out therefore the old leaven. Purge out the old leaven. It's speaking of what we was under also under the old covenant. Read. That ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover even is... Even Christ our Passover... Is sacrificed for us. Is sacrificed for us. So when was Christ sacrificed? At the end of the Passover. Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Are you following this? God. Christ was sacrificed at the end of the Passover day. Okay. Read. Verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Th therefore, let us keep the feast. And that's why, even though the Feast of Unleavened Bread don't start until sundown tomorrow, According to the scriptures, we see the we see the disciples keeping the feast with the communion without leaven. You see that? Read. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Keep the feast. Not with old leaven. Not the old way. 
neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Why? Because that's what was in Judas's heart. Malice and wickedness, having a bad feelings about other people. That's the key thing. It doesn't matter. And, 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 and I see sometimes we get focused so much on the letter and what's right or wrong according to the letter. Well, the Bible doesn't matter to any degree in what it say if we don't feel right about each other. The, the Most High gave us the scriptures so that we can love each other. That's what it was all about. Mm -hmm. So it had nothing to do. Everyone look at the scriptures and how much you know and how you put scriptures together and all that as the, you know, as the pinnacle of what, what should be when really it's about how we are towards each other. That's, that's the key part of the scriptures. That's what it's about. So he says you can keep the feast. So even if we kept it according to the letter, the, letter, the perfect time and everything else, what difference would it make if we got hatred and malice and contention? What good would it be? If we feel in a certain type of way about other people, and what, what good is it? So it doesn't matter to some degree the time and all that if you're going to have malice against your brother. You, you out of time anyway. If you got malice and feel some type of way about some, somebody else. You understand? So we, what the Most High want us to look at is how our, he wants to look at our spirit and how we are and, 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 and what are we letting affect us negatively. Hmm. To sit at a table with brothers and sisters and have a problem with them is a problem. That's the problem. So he's given that example paralleling who? Judas. Judas had a problem with Christ. Now that problem actually came out during the time that this woman came with the uh, oil. But there was a seed in Judas before that. This thing was building. And that happened between us. We tolerate stuff and look at stuff and don't forgive stuff. And we'll build an account against a brother or sister. As if something is not wrong with us. And I hear it all the time how some, someone may look at something and be like, well, I, I thought this was Christ, but I'm seeing this, 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 and this, and I, I don't know if this is right. Okay. You, okay, you don't know if it's right. I don't know if you're right. <laughs> because why? How can you sit and look at something and judge it and look at it and see it wrong and build an account and not have no positive effect on it or try to change it? It's wrong. The, the worst thing people can do is sit around and just talk about what they think is wrong. When if you see what's wrong, it's on you to fix it. It's on you to bring it to the forefront to correct it. Or you can be like Judas. Hey, this ain't Christ. Look at it. They, they're doing this and he's doing that. I, I don't know. I, I, hey, I'm just going to be in the spirit. I'm just going to be in the, I'm just gonna be in the scriptures. <laughs> If you was in the scriptures, you wouldn't be spreading your nonsense. Mm -hmm. If you feel a certain type of way about something, if you're not going to go the right way with it, then keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, if it's not to embedder or make it better, keep it to yourself. Don't spread it so that now somebody else is saying, yeah, I've been noticing that too. <laughs> now you got two heretical jokers looking to stare something up. That's how it happens. And eventually the church continues and the work continues. And these two people who thought they knew everything is just left somewhere. Mm. With no gathering, nobody, they just separated themselves because of what they thought was wrong. Mm. That's what happens. That's the spirit of Judas. And I'm not saying that a person, when they see something wrong, that they shouldn't say anything, but do it through the proper channels. Go correct it with the people you can correct it with instead of spreading madness and causing division. Right? Come. Let me just finish up. Yes, sir.
Uh, verse 8. Come Therefore, on. let us keep the feast. Keep the feast. Not with old leaven. Not with old leaven. Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Go ahead. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Sincerity and truth. Read. That's, that's it. Being true. What was the proper way for Judas to deal with that? I'm going to give them give that as an example. To I'm, demonstrate Christ. Uh, he should have waited till everybody was gone, supported Christ in what Christ was doing because he didn't understand it, and sat down with Christ and had a meeting with Christ and say, well, listen. And Christ would have taught him and gave him understanding. But he was looking for an opportunity to do what? Grandstand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he should have. How many times Christ dealt with something the disciples didn't understand? And then in private, he'll go break it down to him. You understand? But no, he said, he, he looked at this, oh, and now I can show my spirit, what I'm dealing with, how much, how much knowledge I got, how much charity I have. And that's what happens. We look at a scenario and we judge it wrong. And we use that as a wedge between our brethren. Like I said, if we feel a certain type of way about each other, then the scriptures are void. The Most High gave us the scriptures so that we wouldn't have malice or hatred, so that we couldn't care about each other. That's what he gave us the scriptures for. Okay? For learning, for self-examination, for correction. And he gave us the scriptures so that we can deal with issues before malice and con content develops. Because it doesn't matter how right you are now. You're in the spirit of Satan now that you have contention and strife. Doesn't matter how right you may see things. Hmm. Just one more thing, one thing I want to read on that. Yes. Uh, Matthew 22 and 35. Go ahead. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Which is the great commandment in the law? Now, when it says tempting him, this was a question being asked uh, uh, facetiously. Hmm. This wasn't, he didn't ask the question to actually get, get an answer in earnest. Mm -hmm. He already knew the answer according to his education. Mm -hmm. So he, so now he's coming to Christ. Okay, so read, read that part again, lawyer. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him. Tempting him. And saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? What is the great commandment in the law? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, as a lawyer, he's educated. Mm -hmm. He think he know he got it going on. He mm -hmm. think he know the law back and forth. People actually go to him about the law. What's the greatest law? What did Christ say? 37. Yeshia said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Read it again. Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart. Love the Most High with all thine heart. And with all thy soul. And with all thy mind. Go ahead. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto, unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. With these two commandments hang what? All the law and the prophets. It doesn't matter what we're following according to the law and whether or not we own the letter and the time schedule. It does matter if you're in the spirit. Mm-hmm. But if you have all these things right and you feel some type of way and you feel in hatred and malice and contention, these things mean nothing. So what we're going to do tomorrow night, we're going to go into the Passover feast and we'll talk about the Passover and Christ's sacrifice tomorrow night. So that's our communion. And... Uh, Let's say a prayer, then let's eat.